Yesterday, I was walking the dogs, and as I passed a neighbor's house, I looked at their roof and realized there's a whole other reason electric cars like Tesla have to win the market share battle, and soon. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. There are many reasons Tesla and other EV cars are selling faster than they can be made. They're cheaper to power, far cheaper to operate, will last longer in general, and on and on. But one big reason they have to win the market share battle is simply flexibility. As I said, I was walking the dogs, I looked up at my neighbor's roof and saw their solar panels, and I thought again about how much I'd like to have them on my own roof, someday soon, hopefully. <laughs> but then I thought, wait, this little set of roof panels is also a key to why battery cars have to take over. Yes, of course, solar costs are decreasing at a steady rate every year, and that means that solar will be far, far cheaper to build and deploy soon than traditional power plants like coal or gas. In some places like California, this is already true. So your car very well could be powered by the sun sooner rather than later. But what happens if, say, a big wind breakthrough happens and prices drop drastically for wind power? Or what happens if we get fusion running tomorrow and power is practically unlimited? Sorry. <laughs> it's never going to happen, right? But one can dream 20 years from now. Or what if some totally new technology comes along like better geothermal technology? Well, in each of these cases, and really any other you can think of, your Tesla or other EV car will be fine. As long as something is generating electricity, your car can use that to charge. Heck, think about going on a road trip across the United States in your new Tesla. You might start in West Virginia, which is almost entirely coal-powered. You drive through Missouri, where power is generated by a big nuclear plant. You then drive through Oklahoma, where power is a combination of natural gas and wind. Then you drive through Arizona, where the energy is mostly solar and then on to San Bernardino, California, where there are massive wind farms in the mountains. Do you and your Tesla care one bit where all this electricity is coming from or how it's produced? Of course not, not at all. You pull up to a charging station, you charge up, and you keep on going. That is heterogeneous energy sourcing. As long as the source can move electrons, you don't care what that source is. You just charge with it. Let's think about that same trip in an internal combustion engine car in just a moment. But first, if you enjoy this video, definitely like it so other people can find it. And please do subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content so you can see more of it. Also, a real big shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for all the help that you've given and all the support. And as always, a big thank you to Zenly Music for doing the intro and conclusion music. Thanks so much. And finally, don't forget that we are affiliates of both Tesla and Amazon. If you look in the description and click on the links, you can help out the channel and help yourself out at the same time. All right, so what about taking this same trip with a gas-powered car? So you drive to a gas station in West Virginia, and then in one in Missouri, and other states too as you go along, but anyway, and then one in Oklahoma, and Arizona, and California, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So in each case, you have to drive to a gas station in each state and fill up with, amazingly enough, gasoline, yes. <laughs> yes, I know there are flex fuel vehicles, so you can get away with some ethanol in the gas, but still, it's mostly gasoline. And your internal combustion engine car will only ever be able to use gas or diesel if it's a diesel car. And that's it. If oil gets expensive, then gas goes up and you pay for it. If oil gets scarce, you have an oil crisis and you wait in line at the gas station. And yes, this happened to me as a child in I think it was 1972. So I remember how vulnerable we all are to oil being withheld. Well, on the other hand, what if coal gets too expensive? Well, you can pivot to using natural gas or wind power. What if batteries get super cheap and plentiful? You can pivot to solar plus batteries or wind plus batteries. And what if we get fusion? <laughs> I keep trying to say that with a straight face. I just can't. <laughs> I just have to keep bringing up fusion. 20 years, man. 20 years. Well, in that case, anyway, we would use fusion power. So see how much better EV cars are? They can pivot to using any power source that produces electricity. And think about how cumbersome oil and gas are. They have to be dug up. They have to, well, actually, first you have to find them, then you have to dig them up, then they have to be transported to massive refineries, then they have to be refined at those massive refineries, then they have to be transported to local gas stations, then they have to be put in expensive environmentally sealed containers so that they don't leak into the ground and poison your neighborhood, and then you can fill up your gas tank. Yes, I know, lots of electricity production right now currently follows this path as well, especially coal and natural gas. But that is changing, and how much easier is it to transport electricity once it's created? You zip it over the power lines right to where you need it. 
And again, this gets better. Getting back to my neighbor's house, if she had a Tesla or an EV car, she could generate the electricity just a few meters from where she charges her car. That's about as local as you can get and doesn't even require a grid. So as you can see, gas cars just can't compete on their very foundation, where they get their power. EVs can charge almost anywhere in the world, either through the existing grid or via local production of power. They can run off many, many power sources or heterogeneous power sources. They can become greener over time, and the cost to build out more capacity to your door is far, far less than for oil or gas. Just think about developing countries without a good electrical grid in them. So you could take a country like that, and especially if it has decent sunlight or decent wind power capabilities, you can install local power to that area and you can actually generate the electricity that you need not only to power the houses and stuff but to power the transportation needs of these countries and that's one of the biggest things that holds back what third world or developing nation countries is that they don't have power in the hands of consumers and industry and thus they can't build out and they can't develop so the ability to create power is fantastic but also the ability to run transportation off that power using battery electric vehicles vehicles is amazing and really, really critical. So this is the kind of thing that's not only going to help first world countries or developed nations, but it's going to help even out the playing field and rise the tide for all boats, as they say. And that flexibility for developing as well as developed nations is an amazing benefit that battery electric vehicles have over gas. As if declining costs and better reliability weren't enough, this energy flexibility for EV cars is the final nail in the ICE cars coffin. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it informative. If you did, definitely... All right, I hope you enjoyed this little episode and found it informative. If you did, definitely like and subscribe. And in the meantime, please ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is knows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.